I have a t-shirt that I put out, somebody just had me sign one, that says, I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. Greetings. Welcome once again to Justify Nonetheless. I am Kevin Berger, and I apply the principles of polemics and skepticism to atheism and the claims made by atheists. I want to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. That's a statement that Matt Dillahunty has made on numerous occasions, and in my unanswered email to him that I discussed in a previous video, I touched on an objection to this view. I thought it was worth expanding on my objections. What's particularly interesting to me is the reasoning behind why it is that Matt wants to believe as many true things and not believe as many false things as possible. And it really, to me, speaks to the whole idea of non-belief in general. Let's have a listen to what he says. It's not that people are comfortable being wrong because they probably think they're right. They're uncomfortable being exposed as being wrong. And being exposed is something that all of us try desperately to avoid. Atheists, humanists, free thinkers, skeptics, secularists, we haven't cornered the market on reason, we haven't cornered the market on virtue, and we haven't cornered the market on getting out from underneath our biases and our fears. Are we better at it than others? Sure. There may be people who are better at it than we are. One objection that I didn't mention in that email was the idea that wanting to believe as many true things and not believe as many untrue things as possible is that this implies that one has a choice in the first place, which we don't. There are non-resistant atheists worldwide who express a sincere desire to believe and an inability to do so. So to say that belief is a choice is to effectively claim that they're lying or that they're somehow mistaken. In the case of the former, this would entail implicit assertion of telepathy, which is an extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence to support it. In the case of the latter, if one can be mistaken about wanting to believe it in a deity, if one argues that people can not sincerely have this desire and only think that they do, then it logically follows that one can also believe that no deity exists and mistakenly only think that they don't. It's kind of a problem, isn't it? Here's what Matt has to say about the involuntary nature of belief. Convinced. You're either yeah. convinced or you're not, and you become convinced for good reasons or bad reasons. And What's strange here is that Matt himself recognizes the fact that belief is involuntary, but then he expresses his desire as if it matters. This cannot be stressed enough. One, we cannot come to believe or not believe something through the sheer force of will, and two, while we do have some degree of control over the situation in which we allow ourselves to be exposed, not even this is completely in our control. We either believe or we don't. And although I am repeatedly told that there is one, I have yet to be shown any distinction in reality between not believing a claim and instead believing the opposite of that claim. Yes, they are different concepts. Yes, there are different words with different definitions and descriptions. It has analogies and personal experiences that accompany it. None of that makes anything real, which is the point of contention. And if it did, then we can conclude all sorts of things from fairies to unicorns to yes, even deities exist too, because they have concepts, words, definitions, descriptions, accompanying analogies and personal experiences as well. Belief is a brain state, a fact that Matt himself acknowledges and a difference in brain states has not been substantiated. I'll be following up with that in another video. But for the sake of argument, let's ignore all of that. Let's say that one does sincerely want to believe as many true things and not believe as many untrue things as possible. Let's say that one can also choose whether to believe or not. There's another issue that I want to address, and I touched on this in the prior video as well. If it is understood that knowledge is justified true belief, then it follows that not only is non-belief not knowledge, it isn't a path to knowledge either. It has been said that we learn from our mistakes, not from what we already know. If we only lend tentative belief to what has already been demonstrated to be true, we effectively deny ourselves the opportunity to discover anything new. Indeed, if you already think that you have the right answer because you only accept what has already been established, what motivation do you have to look? 
This is the criticism that atheists level at religious adherence. Indeed, the idea of wanting to believe as many true things and not believe as many untrue things as possible, though a noble cause, undervalues or outright ignores the value of creativity, epiphany, imagination, and serendipity. Consider, for example, the Big Bang Theory, Continental Drift, Germ Theory, and the heliocentric model of the solar system and quantum mechanics were all initially rejected due to insufficient evidence, yet were ultimately accepted because they were right. In the case of continental drift specifically, approximately 50 years passed between Alfred Wegener's initial proposal in 1912 and its acceptance in the 1960s. And the heliocentric model of the solar system dates back to the ancient Greeks, such as Antiochus of Samos in the 3rd century BCE. And it was not widely accepted until the 16th and 17th centuries with the work of Copernicus, Kepler, and Galileo. This represents a gap of over a millennium between the initial proposal and the widespread acceptance of the heliocentric model. Archimedes' principle, Einstein's theory of special relativity, and Newton's theory of gravity are all owed to epiphany. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, Robert Goddard's development of rocketry, and Arthur Schuster's playful suggestion of antimatter are owed to their respective imaginations. Heinrich Hertz's work with radio waves, James Watson and Francis Crick's understanding of the structure of DNA, and Urban Le Verrier and John Couch Adams' discovery of Neptune to intuition, and the discoveries of penicillin by Alexander Fleming, microwaves by Percy Spencer, Teflon by Roy Plunkett, and X-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen are all owed to serendipity. In all of these cases, and various others, advancements were made because these individuals were willing to risk being wrong by challenging the existing paradigms rather than accepting what had already been demonstrated as being true. It seems to me, then, that both wanting to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible and being willing to be wrong have value. These mentalities are actually complementary for one another. Having the courage to risk being wrong keeps us reaching for the stars, while being skeptical keeps us grounded in reality. Empiricism and evidentialism aren't the only valid epistemologies, and the risk of being wrong for the purpose of seeking knowledge can be founded with alternative epistemic justification. So with all that in mind, give yourself a break. Be willing to be wrong. It's not the end of the world. That being said, even if your beliefs aren't necessarily true, they should be justified nonetheless.